Uh, all right, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Doug Cothey. He has 38 years of experience in conducting and leading applied R&D in computational science applications designed to simulate complex physical phenomena in, in the energy, defense, and manufacturing se uh, sectors. Doug is currently the director of the U.S. Department of Energy uh, Exascale Computing Project and Associate Laboratory Director of the Computing and Computational Sciences Directorate at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Other positions for Doug at Ornell, uh, where he has been since 2006, include Director of Science at the National Center for Computational Sciences and Director of the Consortium for Advanced Simulation of Light Water Reactors, which is how I know Doug. Um, that was the DOE's first energy innovation hub. In leading the Castle Hub, Doug drove the creation, application, and deployment of an innovative virtual environment for reactor applications, which was a 2016 R&D award winner. Uh, and this offered a technology step change for the U.S. nuclear industry. Before coming to ORNL, Doug spent 20 years at Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he held a number of technical line and program management positions, with a common theme being the development and application of modeling and simulation techniques targeting multi-physics phenomena characterized by the presence of compressible or incompressible interfacial fluid flow where his field-changing accomplishments are known internationally. Doug also spent one year at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in the late 80s as a physicist in defense sciences, and Doug holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemical Engineering from University of Missouri in Columbia and a Master's of Science and a Doctor of Philosophy in my favorite field, nuclear engineering, from my favorite university outside this one, Purdue. <laughs> Thanks, Brendan. Uh, you, you didn't have to read all that stuff. Um, Brendan was a rock star in Castle. I really wish he would have gone to Oak Ridge instead of stay here. It's too cold up here. But um, anyway, Brendan was, uh, was one of our key people. It's great to be here. Um, look, let's see. How, how long do I have? Two hours? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> So I'm going to move really fast. This is an exciting project. There's a lot going on. I'll leave the slides behind. Maybe that's the wrong way, but instead of going deep, I want to go broad. So uh, I've got a lot of stuff I want to cover and look forward to the panel session. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk, talk about Exascale. Chris John uh, really teed this up pretty well. Uh, so this is an example of what applications of Exascale can potentially solve or address with their, with their outcomes and, uh, and impact. And I'm going to cover a few examples here. Yeah, okay. In any case, Amitava talked this morning. Sorry, Amitava, I missed it. Okay. But uh, right down here, he talked about his application. Certainly, climate is a big deal. Uh, but basically, we built applications that cover the whole mission of DOE, from energy production, energy transmission, uh, scientific discovery, uh, applied, applied offices, National security, it's been really an exciting gig. We've been doing this for, it feels like forever, but uh, six years going on seven, I think uh, we're really going to see the fruits of our labor. So this is just a, kind of a really broad brush of, of all the apps and the problems they're addressing. Uh, Christian just talked about, um, in this case, climate. So here the focus is really more about, frankly, about adaptation, trying to understand What's going to, what, you know, where are we going to have droughts or severe events or whatever? Okay. And so she talked a lot about the, uh, the DOE effort, E3SM. So I won't hit that uh, in, into too much of, of detail. So there are 17 national labs, and yes, we're, we're hiring all of us. So talk to me if you're interested. Okay, shameless, but I'll do it anyway. Um, there have been six national labs that have historically deployed and operated large computers. In this case, what you see is over the past kind of decade, it's kind of the, some of the major systems that have been deployed at the three NSA labs and then uh, Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Berkeley. Our focus has not just been on the three exas, first exascale systems, although Frontier's here, uh, Aurora's arriving, and El Capitan's arriving. We've worked a lot on some of these other systems, and they've been really instrumental. And they're non-trivial systems with a lot of power. Uh, so in any case, uh, for ECP, we started in 2016. I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, it, it takes a long time to really dive in and plan for deployment of these systems. So if you're interested in high-performance computing, and by looking at the posters here, a lot of, a lot of students here are, uh, the, this is a great activity to be involved in to deploy, procure, and operate a system. Frontier was really a decadal effort, and um, it's, uh, just, it's probably going to go live in terms of general availability in just a few weeks. 
but it's been it's not something we've been thinking about just last year. So it's been a decadal effort, and ECP is a project that's been building apps and software stacks. So the first time in my very long career, thank you, Brendan, we have a parallel project that's building software along with procuring the systems, and that's been quite a remarkable, uh, a remarkable ride. Speeds and feeds of Frontier, you can find all this online. I'll put the things that I liked in blue. Uh, basically, it's 9,472 nodes. It's got uh, about two exaflop double precision peak. Uh, a lot of memory, though as, a, as an application person myself, never enough, but uh, 4.6 of DDM, of HBM, and 4.6 of DDR. Uh, lots of bandwidth down to the GPUs, lots of good memory bandwidth. A lot of non-volatile memory, 4 terabytes per node, and I think we're still trying to figure out just how we need to exploit that. Uh, has, has a reasonable network, um, really a lot of innovative aspects to this design. So I'll, again, I'll leave this behind. Uh, a closer look at the node. So what we've done at Oak Ridge, we were really kind of the first to uh, uh, land with Roadrunner, with the, the uh, cell processor, and then us at Titan in 2012, jumping into the deep end with GPUs. Back in 2012, NVIDIA was a very small company, and we sat down with them and we said, hey, this looks interesting, but we really need 64-bit. They didn't have it. They really need error correction. They didn't have it. We worked closely with them and invested and made sure those, things, those, those uh, hardware details were put in. So now here we are kind of a decade later, and we've got, as Christian mentioned, AMD, Intel, and NVIDIA really going all in on accelerators. And, and I like to call them accelerators because GPUs really are a type of accelerator that accelerates certain hardware operations, okay? There's a lot of great integer operations, but there's a lot of great floating point operations. In this case, we've gone from kind of one-to-one to, -one to three-to-one, now to four-to-one GPU to CPU ratio. And so what you see here is it's fairly coherent, coherent memory, on, uh, on a node, and the, the really way cool feature is each GPU has a network interface card out to, to the interconnect, and so one can do GPU direct or MPI from GPU to GPU off node. That's, that's unique and that's new. Uh, in any case, I'll, I'll, I'll move on, and let me just say that the system is probably under provision for uh, heavy duty machine learning training. So a two exaflop system probably needs about 100 terabytes per second ingestion. That said, by, if we use the, the non-volatile memory creatively, we can get maybe 60 or 70. For, for more traditional mod sim, 10, 10 terabytes a second is, is pretty good. So it's got a, it's not necessarily, uh, I mean, it's, it's a pretty nice I.O. system, 750 petabytes, uh, which is a lot of, a lot of uh, disk space, a disk, but a decent bandwidth. So one, one of the things that really enabled Frontier to be deployed is back in 2012, or in 2009, we started thinking exascale. Uh, it, it was deployable then, but it would have cost uh, probably billions of dollars, would have consumed maybe a gigawatt or at least a couple hundred megawatts. We realized then we needed to invest with our U.S. HPC vendors to really bring down, bring down the power, bring up the resilience, go after the extreme parallelism. So after uh, multiple years of investment with vendors like Intel and HPE and NVIDIA, we were able to drive that power from per exaflop down. The goal was 20, and we got to about 15 in Frontier. Uh, I think to get to Zeta scale, and you know, we could we could ask why do we need that? I think climate's a great driver as an example. We probably need to drive the power consumption down to another factor of a thousand for systems like this to be used, useful, and affordable. So we're quite proud of the fact that we hit a hit a key metric um, in being able to afford the system in a uh, in, from a power point of view. So now I'm going to talk about the X scale computing project. Really, the rest of the talk. And again, this is a project that's building applications, building a software stack, and integrating all, the, all, that, all that technology onto uh, not just the exascale systems, but pre-exascale. In fact, as maybe Amitava mentioned, I'll just say this, all of our code development really runs from laptops to desktops to engineering clusters on up. We're not building uh, applications that are just boutique applications that only run on exascale hardware. So the project itself is a large software project. Uh, I've been on point, well, I've been involved in the project in, since really it's uh, 2015, ramping it up. Uh, but I, uh, I first led the application area, and now I lead the whole project over the past four or five years. So I'm something I'm very, very proud, proud of. Uh, again, six lead labs, but uh, 15 of the 17 labs are involved, many, many universities like Michigan, and uh, many, many private companies. So uh, a big, big, huge endeavor. So one of the key things we've, we've known or we've been working on you know, since the beginning of the project is really, okay, we have Titan back in 2012. We're kind of starting to figure out how to exploit the GPUs. 
and you can see some it's been a real workhorse and then now uh, Frontier which is about ready to be to uh, to be opened up to the public you can see some trends again going from one to three to four to one GPU ratio you can see that the the interconnects which are really kind of more the secret sauce of these systems and more the proprietary aspects have moved from from really a uh, Cray, Cray Gemini network to more of a standard InfiniBand now to a basically a, a, a proprietary uh, interconnect node, a slingshot that HPE um, apportions. Fat Tree is probably the best topology in my mind. Frontier has a dragonfly, which, which, uh, which really isn't bad, but uh, for scalable systems, uh, I think we found that Summit's been, been a great, been a great, uh, great platform. So uh, in, in terms of the accelerators, um, what if you don't use them? Well, on, on, uh, on Summit, it's a 200 petaflop system. If you don't use accelerators, it's about a six petaflop system. So you're really kind of looking in the rearview mirror about a dozen years. Uh, in other words, you're using an old, old system. And it's even worse with, uh, well, they're, they're about 95% on Frontier instead of about 98 on, on Summit. But Frontier with the two exaflop double precision peak, you can imagine if you're not using the GPUs, you might as well just get off on an engineering cluster. And so whether you like them or not, they're here to stay. And they're here to stay for the foreseeable future. So when we talk about the applications, the idea here was to select a, a, a collection of first mover applications. There are hundreds of important applications. We didn't have the time or the, or the funding to be able to go after all that we'd like to go after. But we carefully negotiated with each Department of Energy program, program office, and there were 10 of them that we interacted with to select a particular target problem and to select a team. And the target problem we call a challenge problem. It's one that's strategically important to the program office, not solved today, is amenable to solutions at, at exascale. And so each one of these applications has a specific kind of problem they're going after with the, the not the hope, but the expectation that the application in the end will be very general, but to be able to measure their performance and measure their, their uh, sort of the roadmap on the science side, each one has a very specific problem to try to tackle. And Alma will probably address that uh, this morning. So I'll, I'll give you a few examples of applications here. So again, we started with millions of lines of codes, lots of different codes. Uh, basically, uh, and, and the previous speaker did refer to uh, the uh, kind of the Fortran to C++ evolution. I'll say a little bit about that. But in the end, every application, I'll, again, this is an eye chart, but I want to leave these behind for you to take a look at and feel free to, to contact me. So here you see the domain and kind of their base challenge problem, which is, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a C grade if you can show you can address this problem. We're not saying you're going to necessarily solve it, but show that you have the algorithms and the physics all together that you're really capturing the phenomena that you want to capture. And there's also stretch challenge problems, too, which are really about, you know, really sort of blowing the doors off things. Each application has its own, as you can imagine, its own set of challenges. Some, the model's pretty fixed, and they're working on algorithms and software. But for most, the model's not fixed. Models evolve. They're bringing in multiple codes to couple, different algorithms, different software architectures. And so uh, lots of acronyms here. I apologize. But each application had its own set of unique uh, challenges. Each application team, consisting of anywhere from about 5 to 30 including students and postdocs, uh, really it was an eclectic mix of, of, of engineers, of physicists, of chemists, of, of domain, so domain scientists, computer scientists, mathematicians, and software engineers. So when we think about moving to the GPU, it's really kind of a multidimensional challenge. So just porting to be able to sort of, let's just say, I'm running on the GPUs and I'm, I'm effectively using the GPUs, uh, you know, has a lot to do with uh, memory coalescing, loop, loop reordering, co uh, kernel, kernel flattening. So you need, need to understand how the GPU works and basically being able to break things up. In the case of some codes, 60,000 lines, one big 60,000 line loop had to be totally rewritten. As uh, Brendan probably knows, it was a Monte Carlo code. Had to totally rethink the algorithm. And that's where we get into the middle, the middle circle here, which is really thinking about, okay, communication is costly. It takes a lot of energy. Uh, instead of uh, store, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to recompute on the fly. I've got free flops next to me on the GPU. So you have to rethink a lot of things. And then adapting the models, the Monte Carlo example is, is a good, uh, good example I'll get to a little bit later. But in many cases, particles really work well, so how can I m more effectively use particles or totally rethink some of my algorithms? So there's been a lot of fun algorithmic work in this journey as well. 
what we've seen in the, uh, over ECP and really since 2012 is we've gone from kind of a CPU only to CPU, GPU, and so I'll sort of mix and match the, the load and do a host to device, device to host, copy back and forth of data. You compute here, I'll compute there. Now with multiple GPUs, uh, the GPUs have the high, high bandwidth memory, so you get a lot of effective performance. Now we're going to figure out, well, how do I use two or three GPUs? And ultimately, where we are now is there's enough GPUs and enough memory that I'm just going to go down there and live on the GPUs. So I'm going to initiate things, I'm going to go down there and live, and I'm going to try to stay there as much as I can because it's costly to go back and forth. So um, what we've seen with the applications that are on the hook for performance, so a lot of our applications, about half of them, need to show they can do new science but also show that they can get a, a certain performance increase. So getting the same answer faster merely means nothing. So basically by performance we're talking about science per unit time. So we want better science faster. So each application had its own work rate. So what you're, what you're seeing here is work rate over three years just on Summit. And so we set this 50x bar and it looks like, and you know, one would would argue that we really sandbagged because we hit 50x for a lot of the apps just on Summit. Well, in many cases, or in a few cases, like the earthquake simulator and um, the molecular dynamics, there were snippets of code that have been dormant for decades. I mean, these app a good application will live three, three, four decades. And so we had a lot of legacy code that hadn't been looked at in a while, and just taking a hard look at it gave some incredible performance and very surprising. But it doesn't mean these apps are done because the problem they want to run on Frontier doesn't fit on Summit. So these are kind of benchmark problems that show there's good progress. Nevertheless, we're very kind of, actually, the performance uh, exceeded expectations for a number of applications. The, the previous speaker talked about moving to a GPU and what, what we've not done in, G, in ECP, and you might say that it didn't make sense, but I think it'll prove it was the right way to go, is we did not mandate a programming model. We wanted to make sure that we sort of emit a, uh, a programming environment that allows multiple options. And so what you see here are choices that application developers have made kind of based on how portable and productive do I want to be and how much control do I want. If I want to have ultimate control, then I'm going to program on the metal with, with, uh, with CUDA or HIP or SICL, and I'm not going to bring in any other abstraction layers. I'm going to own it, okay? A lot of application developers, you know, were, were reluctant, at least at the beginning of ECP, to bring in other components that other teams built because... Now I have to rely on that other team, or I have to rely on that technology. But as you kind of move up here and you adopt uh, more abstractions, whether it's OpenMP or you move on up to, uh, to Cocos and Raja and Aka in this case, uh, you begin to rely more and more on these abstraction layers. And what we found, in particular with Cocos, that came out of Sandia, um, is about almost half of the applications ended up adopting Cocos, which was, uh, which was incredible. So uh, it's now a, a really common community. Of, I call it a, an abstraction layer because basically as an application person, then I'll rely on Cocos to allocate my data on a GPU. I'll rely on Cocos to do fundamental matrix vector, matrix matrix opera operations. So think of it as like a black box that handles all that ugl ugliness, which is great because now I can focus on the science. But if I want to get down there and learn and understand and kind of have more control, then maybe, maybe I won't do it. Uh, but Cocos actually is turning out that certain features of Cocos are integra integrating themselves into the C++ standard. And the Cocos team tells me that their goal is to get themselves out of business. I don't quite believe that, but ultimately all the abstraction uh, sort of syntax in Cocos could eventually end up in C++, in which case we now have abstractions as part of the language. I'll also say that if you played around with Copilot or, Copilot or ChatGPT to write code, it knows about Cocos, which is incredible. And so we've seen that it's been able to basically interpret some interesting code for us. And so I think the way we program in the future is going to really change. One of the bets we made at the beginning of ECP was, you know, most applications use a small number of motifs, and we're going to call a motif a common pattern of communication and computation. You see the first seven on the left, Phil Colella coined back in 1986, and then a couple decades later, Berkeley said, well, if you th think about data science, there's another five or six or so. So we looked at this, and we surveyed the applications, and we said, you know, I think what, what we should do is let's dive deep into these motifs. And we call them co-design centers. It's a little bit misnamed because all throughout ECP there's co-design. It's really kind of through the software stack instead of down on the hardware. Uh, but in this case, it was sort of a legacy name. But I want to talk a little bit about some co-design centers that have tackled very um, sort of typical motifs we see in fundamental mod sim apps, structured grids, unstructured grids, particles, graphs, et cetera.
And so uh, they've turned out to be very, uh, very successful, much more than I thought. The first is patch-based AMR, and the John Bell leads this effort in AMRX. And what you see that of the t kind of 24 ECP principal codes, six have chosen to live totally on AMRX. And so what we've done is we created a new community middleware layer uh, through John Bell and company. And you see the, the idea here is if you let me do the patch-based refinement, I'll push particles on the patches, I'll do your linear solves if you want me to, I'll handle the embedded boundaries underneath, I'll handle all the ug ugliness, okay, off-node off and on-node. And that's been a surprising, I shouldn't say surprising because John Bell's a real star here, uh, development. And in earlier this year, and, and apologies, these are eye charts, but I'm going to leave mine, we asked the team to say, okay, why don't you write down the then and now, which was where were we in 16 and now where we are, where are we in 18? And, you know, just take, take a quick glance at sort of the, the technology step change that's been imparted by this team. And what we found, I think, in, you know, these aren't heavy, heavy investments with the right team and focusing on the right problem. Uh, and on one problem over multiple years, you can make tremendous gains. And so AMRX, again, isn't just patch-based AMR. It's a lot of other great features. And I'll, get, I'll show some examples of what code bases have been able to do with it. So Pele, for example, is a combustion application, Jackie Chan at Sandia. Being in this project, she had S3D, which was a fundamental compressible uh, LES and DNS code. Uh, what happened is Pele started from scratch, a compressible version and a low Mach number version. And you kind of see here on the right the evolution in terms of bringing in new physics. EV is embedded boundaries, bringing in GPUs. I'm going to use particles to track, you know, fuel spray and soot. Uh, so in other words, uh, they've chosen to totally live on, on AMRX and been able to really move forward uh, very, very quickly. And on the, on the left, you see the simulation specs they ran on Frontier. And the thing that's way cool to me is basically if you do the math on the effective resolution, the effective re resolution, the required resolution to get down sub-micron would have been about 9 trillion cells. And with AMR, you know, it was just 60 billion, okay? So basically executing a nice simulation, a uh, trillion class simulation with billions, okay? So that's a big win for, for AMR. They don't have to convince this audience. Another one, um, and the teams came up with the names of their projects. So everything's EXA, which is maybe a little annoying because this is just one little stop along the way. But EXA Wind, okay, out of NREL, beginning of the project, they had a uh, kind of a way cool finite element uh, structure code to model to essentially resolve the rotating turbine blades, okay, and even do a little bit of fluid structure interaction. But what they have now is the ability to do multiple turbine blades with an AMR-based AM, uh, AMRX background flow, of course, that's called AMR Win, and they're actually re rewriting WARF, the weather code, uh, on top of AMRX. So really to do a wind farm simulation, the goal is 50 wind farms, okay? You need to have weather, you need to have local topology, you need to have the flow around the turbines, and you need, need to, to model the interacting turbines. It's a canonical exascale plus problem. So why are they doing this? Well, most wind farms lose about 20 to 30 percent of the potential energy coming into the farms due to the turbine-to-turbine -to -turbine buffeting. So we need to understand that, okay? We need to simulate that and understand it, develop a lot of data that we can train an algorithm, machine learning algorithm on to essentially dynamically control the roll pitch yaw of the turbines to be able to get more out of the, uh, the wind farm. It's one of my favorite applications, even, even though as a nuclear engineer, I think there's a great solution for clean energy, as Brandon would probably agree. So uh, let me move on to another one. Another co-design center that's unstructured mesh finite L operations known as SEED. It comes out of Livermore. And so here, if you think about finite element codes, you know, you get into high order discretization, you get into a lot of, of quadrature points, you get into a lot of matrix vector, matrix matrix op operations. And so this team not only says, hey, we can handle the mesh for you, but we can handle and the gathers and scatters, we're going to do all your finite element operations. And so there you see at the top little icons for multiple unstructured mesh codes that have adopted this. I highly recommend you go take a look. It's uh, really overhauled live FIM. I mean, I'm sorry, uh, MFIM and the seed library. And a good example is a uh, full core reactor simulation. So in this case, uh, this is led out of Oak Ridge, uh, Steve Hamilton. Uh, the unstructured mesh uh, incompressible code, NEC 5000, now called NEC RS, uh, rebuilt itself on top of seed and gets incredible performance. And what we're seeing with this application is full core, full CFD, which I think is, is very much needed for a small modular reactor, coupled to 
um, continuous energy Monte Carlo. And the Monte Carlo effort has been way cool to watch. It's uh, really overhauled the shift code, and it pushes around uh, tr literally trillions of particles. And if your cross-sections are reasonably accurate and you have enough particles, I don't think there's any better solution than Monte Carlo. And so here we have a full core coupled simulation capability. That's, I think it's going to be a game changer for, uh, for reactor simulation. Again, some of the speeds and feeds, you can see basically the, the, uh, the kinds of things that they're looking at for performance. How many particles can I push per second? How many degrees of freedom can I solve per second? Uh, so, you know, the, the supposition here is that uh, better resolution gives you better, uh, better answers. And uh, this... This application was one of the first that ran on Frontier, and uh, 6,400 nodes out of 9,472 is still like a one and a half petaflop, one and a half exaflop peak uh, capability. And so, uh, with, each, with each team, we said, "Okay, here's your minimum criteria," and we set this back in 2019. Uh, so we set minimum criteria for what they needed to show that they could do on Frontier, and so far, so good. Many teams like this teams are uh, are, are very easily surpassing. The capability. Another motif that I am very fond of, as more of a, of a, of a particle pusher myself, is uh, Cobana, uh, the Cobana library. And of course, I guess if you're a Barry Manilow fan and, and the center is called Copa, you'll, you'll call it Cobana. So in this library, basically pushes particles on the GPUs, it maps particles to mesh, mesh to particles. A lot of fundamental operations that PIC codes in particular uh, often need and utilize. And again, you see kind of the same uh, abstraction here. You've got uh, a lot of the ugliness or the challenge of uh, implementing on GPU is really hidden from the application. And you see some of the applications that live on top. You see molecular dynamics, particle and cell, uh, material point method, uh, plasma pick. So you see multiple kind of particle-based apps that are now uh, living on this library. Again, this is kind of a dense eye chart, but let me just say that uh, by implementing uh, most of the Actually, all the particle operations in C++ and using COCOS, a Fortran-based code, as Amitabha may, may alluded to, like XGC, okay, can now just call into this library and utilize all the power of COCOS and the C++ implementations without having to overhaul the entire code. So this is a nice way to kind of seamlessly move in to a, a, a C++ environment by uh, um, counting on a library. Another one that I really like, uh, it's really one of our challenging applications, is XAAM. It's additive manufacturing. And here's a really, probably a more challenging, more uh, kind of high-risk application because uh, currently there doesn't exist, in my mind, a real high-fidelity simulation tool for being able to predict the as-printed microstructure. And uh, most people maybe don't appreciate that even though additive manufacturing changes the game and 3D print printing is a big deal, with metal alloys, high-spec metal alloys, you get microsegregation and porosity, and a lot of the printed parts are rejected, especially for defense and aerospace. So we're going after this problem to try to fundamentally understand what's going on there, and then, of course, that understanding will lead to insight about how do we uh, change our processes or design better 3D printers. So this is a, a canonical multi-physics application that, that uh, really couples in multiple, multiple codes from microscale to mesoscale to continuum. And a lot of rich physics there, and um, I think one of our more challenging applications. Another one is uh, Warp X, and this one won a Gordon Bell Award on, on Frontier actually last fall. Basically, uh, full electromagnetic solver, full uh, particle and cell, now going after plasma wake field acceleration, which is a, a way cool uh, way of really getting high intensity, compact, sort of terawatt class uh, accelerators and lasers. In this case, uh, Warp X, you know, really, really kind of a neat, neat to see the evolution. Uh, in 2016, you can see uh, mostly Fortran and Python really didn't have, had a rudimentary uh, adaptive mesh refinement capability, moved to AMRX, and solving 3D Maxwell's equations across patches is really, really hard. A lot of algorithm work required to make sure they didn't get ghost electrostatics or ghost electromagnetics. And so this is Jean-Luc Vey at, uh, at Berkeley. And uh, he actually plotted kind of his figure of merit. His figure of merit, uh, the ratio of the figure of merits is, is the speed up, and basically got 500x once he got onto Frontier. He was probably the second team that got on Frontier in this sort of 10-day rolling window that was mentioned earlier. And here you see, you know, 2016 and, and 2022, uh, a real 
st step change in terms of the, the algorithms and the software and the performance. And so, and you, and you see kind of the, the evolution in his ability to, to uh, increase those performance. In this case, the performance is, is the particle push, the particle time plus the mesh time, kind of times the number of time steps divided by wall clock. So each team developed and defended its own sort of metric for, uh, for performance. This is a nice, pretty movie from the actual Gordon Bell Award, which uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's a, it's a award that really galvanizes and focuses the application community uh, every fall awarded at SC. A couple of other applications, and this is known as uh, Exalt, and this one I think is really creative in terms of the, uh, of the algorithms. So molecular dynamics really, uh, with, with an exascale, you can now do larger systems. You can do more atoms, but the curse is basically a, a picosecond scale time step. So you still can't really integrate out to milliseconds or seconds without some creative uh, algorithm work. And in this case, the, the kinds of phenomena that we're looking at, which is bubble growth in inside of nuclear fuel, so fission product growth, also tungsten uh, bubble growth in time, I'm not sorry, healing bubble growth in inside of tungsten materials on the fusion first wall, uh, replica dynamics really works well in terms of uh, tackling the physics. So this is an example where we're going to fire off now multiple replicas, you know, sort of 100 to 1,000 lamps simulations. And because we have the GPUs, we can do more local quantum simulations. So we're now we're going to call a code called LATTE, which is a DFTB capability. So now I'm going to do some local quantum simulations for the forcing because I because I've got the ability to uh, I have the flops next to me. So send out hundreds of lamp simulations, and the first one that over overcomes a, uh, a a statistical barrier, we stop. Everybody then moves forward with the large delta t into some of the uh, the some of the replicas, and so. Uh, what they've been able to do with, with Exalt is get fantastic uh, performance increase. And this is an example where they had a potential uh, function in the code that really hadn't been looked at for years. It was called SNAP. And uh, they basically rewrote the, the, the kernel. It was called over and over and over and made a tremendous increase in, in performance. That's very likely going to be tr uh, replaced by an inference engine, in other words, a trained network based on DFT data, DFT simulations and experimental data. Uh, but a really good canonical example of how to bring in uh, kind of machine learning in a, in a sub-grid way or way to sort of augment and accelerate the workflows rather than just replace the app, okay, which I don't think we'll, we'll see. Um, we do have a center called Everything's Exa, Exa Learn for, for machine learning. And what we've done here is we're doing more than dabbling in machine learning, but, you know, we're not investing, you know, it isn't the whole project. But in this case, we're looking at how can we help build surrogates for certain applications how can we sort of influence control design and, uh, and inverse design? And surrogates is probably the one that's most interesting, at least to me, uh, during the lifetime of ECP. And we've been able to do that in the cosmology application, uh, developing um, essentially images of universe, you know, evolution of the universe simulations to be able to be able to uh, compare and contrast with our own. Uh, these are hack hack based simulations out of Argon using GANs, which are very, very useful for, uh, for surrogates. So here I think we've just scratched the surface of the, of the usefulness of surrogates to, for sensitivity analysis and for, uh, for UQ. But, you know, if we look at chat GPT and GPT-4, the bit large language models, GPT-4 just came out last week, you know, we, we can ask ourselves, okay, you know, Frontier is probably the smartest machine in the world. What, how big of a model could we train? We wouldn't do it for, by reading the Internet. We want to do it for science. And so we're actually looking at training large models, uh, you know, so certainly uh, ingesting data such as material science data, material science publications, et cetera. So we've got some sort of some skunk work projects at Oak Ridge right now. But I just, you know, just focus on the one bullet here. Uh, we, we could probably train a 100 trillion parameter model on Frontier. And uh, GPT-4 is about 100 trillion. So we, we're in the ability to train a huge model. It probably would take 15 to 30 days of full machine training. Uh, we're not going to do it just for a stunt, but we are looking at, let's see what, you know, let's see what we can do to, to train some useful models for science. And so we've been engaged in those discussions for, for more than the last few weeks or months, and I'll say a little bit more about that. But we have to remember that we need really good uh, we need good benchmarks for these models. I really like this paper. It's called Beyond the Imitation, the Imitation Game. The Imitation Game is a Turing movie. Okay, and, and this group, I think it's like a 50-author group, uh, came up with a bunch of models that break 
large language model, a bunch of benchmarks that break large language models. And this is one I thought was kind of cute. Basically, ask the models, what movie does this emoji describe? And you can see a 2 million parameter model on down to 128 billion parameter model. And the, the models with very few parameters just suck, frankly, okay? Just terrible answers. So we need something like this for science. We need to have good benchmarks that break these models so that they can guide us and focus and galvanize our efforts. So anyway, I recommend you read that paper. I think we need more like this for science. So what are we doing on the AI side? Well, we've been thinking about this. We've been writing, uh, writing up reports. That's what we do at the DOE. We probably have too many meetings, but we've been having meetings and writing up reports. So I'll point you to this one and then one that's uh, going to come out here very soon. Uh, we had a series of workshops in the last uh, year or so. And you can see what we're focusing on here are basically properties inference, inverse design, autonomy, surrogates, uh, programming. Here is where I, I really do think there's going to be a game changer there where we're going to be able to be much more productive in writing code. Uh, nothing will replace a human, but we're going to be much more productive. Prediction control and foundation models. So I just encourage you to look for that report, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll be able to kind of drive things in a direction in, uh, in, with our Department of Energy sponsors moving forward. I'm going to shift back to a couple of applications and then, and then conclude. One very non-traditional application is the power grid. So we undertook this one in 2016, realizing that it was a very high-risk problem. In other words, if you look at the U.S., you have three, three major interconnects. And if you kind of count up all the points, and a point's an energy generation station, a transformer, distribution, a home, a smart device, you're easily in the billions. So it's well beyond an exascale problem if you want to try to simulate all those points. But, you know, I think going after kind of 100,000 or a million points, and so there's order of 1,000 generation stations in the U.S., maybe 10,000 major distribution centers. So you think of those as a graph, and each point has some certain behaviors, and the connections or the, or the, uh, the edges now are, how, are, are the connection points. And so a, a grid simulation gets into basically graph-based simulations where now you're asking yourselves, I break, a, I break an edge, and that's, that's maybe I've lost a power, I lost power supply. Uh, and one of our problems we're going after is uh, we're going to take 13 gas plants off the grid uh, in the simulation. And what happens with the 60 hertz uh, frequencies, you go down to about 59.7 and you're in trouble, like what happened in, in Texas a few years ago. So that's called an under-frequency problem. So in this case, we're going to simulate the under-frequency problem, try to understand how can we help the grid to respond. What other energy generation units need to come on? What do we need to do? Because operators have kind of seconds or a few minutes to make decisions. Obviously, you can't have an exascale computer in the operating room, but we can, we can train some inference models to at least give some good, some good decisions. So this, is, this has to do with nonlinear optimization, mixed, mixed uh, integer programming. Uh, so a lot of uh, optimization algorithms that really aren't mature or scalable. So a lot of fundamental math here. A couple more uh, non-traditional. And in DOE space, we generally don't, tackle human health, that's NIH, but we have a project where we're working closely with NIH. This is one that has some, some efficacy in the NIH space, but it's about metagenome assembly, where you take snippets of DNA and you really try, or you're trying to assemble it back to, uh, to predict and understand what, what does the ultimate DNA strand look like and what kinds of proteins might it, might it emit. And, you know, the Kathy Yellick, who's a real superstar in our field, started with, a, with an assembler known as HIPMER and basically was able to, oops, I probably hit the wrong button here. Okay. At the time, uh, HIPMER could assemble about 2.6 uh, uh, terabytes of uh, uh, genome data, uh, but it couldn't do it in a scalable way. It would scale up and do some assembly and then it would bottleneck to one node and then scale back out to finish. Basically, what you want to do here is you need to be able to send, assemble a lot of data. So her goal is 50 terabytes scalable, and she's pulling it off. It's now actually the production assembler at JGI, and so this is a, this is, she uses a lot of hash tables. This is an algorithm that really was, you know, never really had been implemented on GPUs. A lot of, it, it uh, required a lot of very creative algorithm work using something known as UPC, Unified Parallel C, and a PGAS language, so really, really nice stuff. Um, the previous speaker talked about E3SM, and um, gosh, back in the early 90s, I was involved in one of the first uh, parallel implementations of, of an ocean code known as POP at the time. So I'm not a climate scientist, 
but I am uh, kind of more than well aware of the challenges. Uh, we work with Mark Taylor here, and our injection into the E3SM effort has really been more, more about the multi-scale modeling framework. And basically with MMF, these able, we're able to implement a super, parameter, super parameterization model for clouds because you've got the GPUs right there. It's an interesting model. You're not really cloud resolving, but you're doing some local mixing to be able to have better, better estimates on mixing. Um, and th this in particular has some great data on basically where the baseline model was in 2016, okay, and kind of what they were able to do 2016. And now you can just see how the baseline model has shifted. And what Mark's calling the baseline model is non-MMF. I'm not going to use that subgrid model, but the baseline model, as a previous speaker mentioned, is still is pretty darn good at three kilometers. What's interesting to me is, you know, you see the simulated years per day, 0.01, and then you see 2.6. Um, ideally, you'd like to do hundreds of century simulations. So I think we're going to see, and Mark actually was able to get uh, over three simulated years per day recently on Frontier. So I think you'll be able to get maybe five or more. But let's just say five simulated years per day. It's still going to take 20 days on Frontier to do one century, okay? We need to do many centuries. So we, need, we have a long ways to go. Uh, but that said, we're really proud that we, we were really, really able to help this effort. One other really more non-traditional simulation is, is uh, being able to model uh, wave, you know, wave propagation due to an earthquake. And this is a Bay Area uh, simulation known as EQSIM, Dave McCallan at uh, Berkeley. And so he's got a fourth order in space, fourth order in time code, SW4, uh, out of Livermore that propagates the waves through, through the geologic strata, but then comes up to the surface and couples with a finite element code for, for the buildings. And uh, basically what he tells me is the buildings that are kind of most suspect are the three to five story buildings, and they couple in quite heavily. And you've got to get the right frequency, and the frequencies are kind of five to ten hertz. And so before this effort was involved in, we were, we were simulating kind of sub one hertz, and we really weren't, weren't picking up the, the phenomena very well. And so now he's really, he shows here I was able to get the right frequencies of 5 to 10 and do the coupling. And so this really helps us to sort of harden structures and sort of make them a little more or maybe a lot more earthquake resilient. Okay, I'll conclude with just a few more slides on, I've not really talked about the software stack much, uh, but what we, we have, um, we built a software stack that, that was based on a lot of pre-existing components uh, before ECP, but now we've packaged them all up into something called E4S, the Extreme Scale Scientific Software Stack. It has about 100 different libraries and components, and one is Clover out of Jack Dongera, a recent Turing winner and a real mover and shaker over many, many decades. So I'll just show kind of example. If you're not familiar with Scalapack, you probably should be, but just where Scalapack was and then now where it is with Slate. He moved to C++ and really has fully full GPU implementations, and so... Uh, you know, call attention to be, you know, be sure to take a look at this. This is fundamental linear algebra. Uh, I think as a community, we've overlooked the importance of FFTs, so we actually work with Jack and uh, are investing in FFTs. FFTs are ubiquitous across code bases. I think we often don't realize how important they are. His, his effort called Hefty has uh, really been moving. Uh, kind of everyone seemed to be using FFTW, which is a 1D FFT, and then kind of cheating, go to 3D with three 1Ds instead of just going full 3D. And we have a lot of non-uniform FFT uh, capabilities now as well. So this is one to call out. And then finally, Ginkgo is something that I didn't think we'd use so much, but we have a need now for a lot of on-node fast solvers, sparse, uh, sparse direct, sparse iterative, and uh, dense direct. So Ginkgo is a, is a fast on-node Krylov-based solver, and we have a lot of codes that are basically sending off fairly large matrices to, say, four GPUs at once or farming out a lot of matrices to a lot of GPUs. So in other words, I don't need to scale across the machine, but I've got hundreds or thousands of smaller matrices that can fit into a GPU, and Ginkgo is, is a really great solution there. So I'll, I will conclude with just noting that E4S has been out there for almost four years now. I recommend you go take a look. Uh, you can get it in containerized forms. It has about 100 products. We release it every three months. Samir Shindy, University of Oregon, uh, is, has endless energy. He's on point for packaging. Uh, you can contact him directly. And uh, frankly, the SPAC build package has been a game changer for us. It's really kind of been a, a major development from Todd Gamlin. 
we build all of our stuff in SPAC. It's been uh, it's been tremendous. So um, you know, I didn't talk much about the apps today. I mean, about the software stack, uh, but there's been tremendous work that's gone on there that um, I think uh, this community would find find to be useful. I have a few wrap up slides that I'll just I'll just uh, I've got some takeaways and stuff, but I'll just go right to uh, questions because I probably blew through my blew through my time. So thanks for your time and attention. All right, I think we. I think we have time for one question. I saw a hand here. Yep. So this uh, exascale stuff is nice, but you mentioned zeta scale. Um, <laughs> Probably and shouldn't you, have. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that we might need a thousand times factor of power efficiency improvement. What do you foresee being? I mean, obviously that's extremely hard to do. What do you see, foresee being the major challenges on that? And do you think that's even possible to do? don't know if it's possible. And the, the thousand comes from a paper written a couple of years ago, sort of doing an analysis on, say, Frontier. And then, you know, I, I, to tell you the truth, I forgot what the power envelope they, they, they recommended, but it's probably less than 100 megawatts, okay? And basically all those numbers, the numbers I, I cited was not necessarily what's, what's doable. It, in the view of these authors, it really would be what's required to make it feasible, okay? And I'm not saying that Zeta scale is the only way to go after all of our science problems. But, um, you know, I'm saying that um, what we need to do as a community is to say, okay, what's, do, do we really need this? And if so, where and why? I mean, one argument, too, is if I can, if I have an application that I feel good about in terms of its ability to, um, to model the right phenomena, and I can speed it up a thousandfold, that's kind of like a Zeta scale app running at exascale. So another way to think about it is, you know, because I think the, the gains you can make in algorithms and, and models outstrips the hardware, okay? And I think we've shown that in ECP where, you know, the factor of 50 was going from Titan was 20 petaflops, okay, to uh, Frontiers, 1,000. So that's kind of a factor of 50. And uh, all of our apps are outstripping that hardware. So you can't just ride that hardware curve. I, I'm not making that point. The point is, as a community, we need to say, is there a, is there a game changer here? And is that scale is the only way? Then, you know, let's, let's understand that and let's see what needs to be done. On the hardware side, you need super low power, you know, whether it's neuromorphic or, or whatever, but you need, or analog devices. I mean, I'm not a hardware person, but that, that's a major challenge. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, I'll tell you what ChatGPT cannot do manage these projects like you do. <laughs> Never, ever. Thank you for all that you do for science and, and for us as a community. Thank this you. is truly inspiring.